Whether you are an experienced pilot or a novice, and whichever paragliding path you wish to follow, whether cross country, mountain flying, or even if you're destined for the newer aspects of the sport, the start of every flight is the takeoff. At the moment of takeoff, each pilot can be subjected to stress from different sources. The configuration of the site, strong or cross winds, and considerations regarding other pilots in the vicinity. Lack of practice can also lead to doubt or hesitation. Don't wait until you are on takeoff to learn how to handle your wing. It's imperative that you train yourself in the correct techniques, the improvement of which will result in safe launches. During this DVD, Pilots of a high level of ability are going to show you how to improve your ground handling technique. We will also demonstrate various exercises, which will be illustrated in varying conditions. So, practice regularly, find some clear ground and go and play with your wing. You'll see how ground handling becomes a real game and your takeoffs more and more assured. Enjoy the film and your ground handling. Like a kite, a paraglider flies within what is known as the wind window. In practical terms, this window is a space in which the wing can fly. This space is defined by the wind and the relative position of the pilot. It's a quarter of a sphere facing the wind, of which the radius is the length of the lines. This window comprises several distinct zones. In green is what is known as the edge of the window. At the window's edge, the power of the wing is at its weakest. The canopy flies very slowly and can even stop flying altogether. Kite surfers use the edge of the window to launch and stop their kites in safety. Inflation at the edge of the window in strong winds can also be performed by some paraglider pilots, but a high level of skill is required. In red, the zone facing the pilot is the power zone. It's here that the wing is at its most powerful. In paragliding, the wing can fly from the top to the bottom and from one side to the other up to the edge of the window. For a paraglider, the wind window and its different zones exist in the same manner as for kiting. In red, the power zone. The wing strongly resists the wind, producing a pulling effect. In green, the lift zone. The air begins to flow over the wing's profile as it progressively reaches flying speed. This is why, in strong winds, the movement of the wing in the power zone is the critical point of the inflation. You can greatly limit the power of the wing in this zone by moving towards it. As you arrive at takeoff, 
your attention is generally focused on weather conditions. Knowing how to prepare your equipment must therefore become automatic so that you're free to concentrate on other aspects of your flight as much as possible. Good preparation of the wing is essential to give yourself the best chance of a perfect inflation. Begin by analysing the conditions. Continue to assess the evolution of the weather as you prepare your equipment. You should prepare and inflate your glider directly into the direction of the wind. If you do this, your glider will ascend symmetrically. Always try your best to raise the wing symmetrically so as to avoid the necessity to move yourself laterally and to be able to correct the inflation more easily. If you don't position the wing at 90 degrees to the wind, the side under more tension will inflate first and attempt to launch before the other half of the wing. The extent of your reaction and the skill it requires will depend on the strength of the wind and the initial movement of the glider. When there is no wind, as here, lay out then position your wing at 90 degrees to the steepest slope. This will aid your takeoff and facilitate a rapid departure from the hill. It's now time to untangle the lines. To make the job easier, start by moving the harness away from the wing to put a little tension on the lines. Check whether the harness needs rotating. Note how freeing the lines should not cause an unnecessary delay. By tightening the lines and walking towards the wing, it's enough to make sure there are no tangles in them. Here, Jerome carries out a swift inspection of each set of lines, from the front to the back of the glider. In the same way, he next ensures that the brake lines slide freely to the end of their travel. Now you can put your harness on and continue with the pre-flight check. We're now going to see the various stages comprising a forward launch. In weak or nil wind conditions, this takeoff technique is often preferred to the reverse launch method. By giving a positive input of energy, the pilot ensures that the wing ascends cleanly. It also gives a certain continuity to the launch, which helps to create a constant loading on the wing. First of all, observe the position. The wing correctly prepared and orientated directly into wind, or in nil wind, on the steepest part of the slope, and with the pilot situated in the centre. Note Jerome's posture. He's looking far ahead, his arms forming a W. The arms and chest are on the same plane. He's ready to provide the energy necessary for launch. This needs to be a relatively dynamic manoeuvre to ensure the wing has enough power to lift cleanly. However, take care to regulate your input according to the strength of the wind. In stronger winds, reduce the force of your input. If you give the wing too much energy, you risk being snatched into the air. In weak conditions, as here, Jerome doesn't hesitate to give a positive input. Then the wing lifts, either quickly or more slowly, to arrive at a position above your head. You should then control it by braking so that it doesn't overfly you. Once again, your actions must be governed by conditions. If the wing climbs rather slowly, very light braking should be enough to prevent it from overflying you. On the other hand, if the glider rises fast, don't hesitate to brake, even quite hard if necessary. However, this should be a brief reaction as you mustn't keep the wing braked for too long. 
As he breaks, note how Jerome takes the opportunity to look up to visually check that the lines are free of tangles and that the canopy is in the correct position. At this stage, he can still decide to continue or abort the takeoff. He decides to continue and starts his takeoff run. In light or nil wind conditions, a sustained effort is required to achieve the speed necessary to create the lift. A committed run also helps to ensure that the wing is adequately pressurized. Look closely at his position. He's clearly leaning forward his shoulders outside the risers. His weight is transmitted to the wing due to firm pressure on the chest strap of his harness. To abort the attempt, brake to the limit, hands at your thighs, and continue to advance so that the wing falls behind you. The glider and pilot form a pendular system. In the air, in the event of rolling or pitching, you are naturally brought back beneath your wing. On the ground, it's a different matter entirely. If your wing moves to the left or right, it's up to you to follow it to regain the equilibrium. At the moment of takeoff, if the wing climbs sideways, you don't have to collapse it and start again. This situation can well be recovered. In the first place, follow the wing while continuing to advance. Next, correct the course of the wing with the opposite brake. In this way, you maintain a good loading on the wing throughout the run, while keeping to the initial direction chosen for it. Once returned to a position of equilibrium, with the wing stabilised above your head, you can start your takeoff run. David's action demonstrates this very well. By moving towards the wing, he causes a canopy to return above his head. Very quickly, the majority of pilots come to prefer the reverse launch because it allows a visual check of the glider. It's also easier, as the wing rises, for the pilot to effect the correct adjustments and find the best position to be in himself. This type of inflation is also better adapted to stronger conditions. There is no correct method. The right method is the one you master and which ensures that you take off safely. In all cases, be attentive to the situation and know how to adapt your reactions as required. The conditions are strong? Maybe you shouldn't wait before starting your takeoff run. Is the takeoff site a gentle sandy or grassy slope, or a steep and rocky incline? For each launch, analyse the situation and act accordingly. We're now going to watch as David demonstrates the crossed brakes method. Turn to face the wing, the risers crossed in front of him, David takes the left brake in his left hand and the right control in his right hand. He next takes the front risers which are in front of each hand. He therefore has in his left hand the left brake and the right hand front risers and in his right hand the right brake and the left hand front risers. This method is very safe because the pilot doesn't have to let go of the controls as he is launching. On the other hand, it can be off-putting at the outset and a potential source of error because the controls are crossed. The right hand brake controls the side of the wing to your left and the left brake controls the right side. Once the wing is stabilised, the pilot can turn round while always maintaining contact with his wing. In strong winds, the movement of the wing in the power zone is the critical moment of the inflation. The wing is in the transitional phase and is barely flying. It presents a strong resistance to the wind, producing a pulling effect. 
At this point you could be surprised by the power of the wing. To reduce this energy, reduce the loading on the wing by walking towards it. David illustrates this by moving 3 or 4 metres towards his wing. Note his flexed position at the moment of surge. Advancing towards the canopy, David stands up, reducing the wing loading a little more. In addition, being flexible makes him more stable and avoids his being unbalanced when the wing starts to pull him. A different situation. For this demonstration, Jerome is using an ultralight wing and the wind is virtually nil. Jerome is going to use the same method of inflation that we've just seen with David. He is simply going to adapt it to the new context. Jerome pre-inflates the wing so as to better position it for the inflation. Note how the wing rises easily despite the absence of wind. With this type of equipment, very light input is required, even in weak conditions. Note that Jerome doesn't have to walk towards the wing. On the contrary, he needs to move backwards to load the wing even more. Here, he's not trying to reduce the speed of the wing, but to increase it, so as to overcome the lack of wind. The wing lifts. Jerome checks it visually as it rises. He controls the wing after turning. It's possible to do this when the wing rises gently. In this situation, very light pressure on the brakes is enough. Then Jerome loads the canopy and starts his run. Now another situation with Timothy at the Dune de Pila. Here he again makes use of the crossed brakes technique, the right hand brake in his right hand and the left brake in his left hand. In contrast however, he handles the brakes differently and he holds the risers in one hand. To control the wing from one side to the other therefore, it's necessary to change the hand holding the risers. Wind conditions are moderate, about 10 km per hour, therefore the leading edge is already inflated. Timothy provides a light input, sufficient in these conditions, and advances slightly towards the wing. He controls it, and having stabilised it, he turns. In all cases this control is essential, but must not last longer than necessary. The context will dictate whether or not you remain stationary before starting your takeoff run, but there is no necessity to do so. Here in light wind and on sand, Timothy allows himself, having controlled the wing, to delay the start of his takeoff run. But be careful, in certain conditions or on certain takeoffs, it's better to launch as soon as the wing is stabilised. He raises his hands to increase the speed of the wing leans into his chest strap and starts his takeoff run. Here's a further example with Russell in slightly stronger conditions. Again you can see how the wing sits up on the ground. In these conditions, only a small force is needed to cause the glider to rise to its full height above the ground. Russell moves towards the wing to reduce its power, then breaks it to prevent it overflying him. 
the wing is stabilized and he turns. Note that the control is effective but is not longer than necessary. A final visual check then he starts a good takeoff run. The final example and another situation here with Jerome. This time the conditions are clearly stronger and the terrain uneven. A light input is all that's necessary to raise the wing to its zenith. The manoeuvre is skillfully carried out and Jerome launches safely. Nevertheless, that's not to say that this launch couldn't have been improved upon. In these strong conditions, Jerome could have advanced a lot more boldly towards the wing at the moment it began to climb. He could also have been more flexed, which would have allowed him to lighten the wing by standing up as it accelerated. Already being upright, however, he was unbalanced and pulled by the wing as it accelerated. Pressurised in this way, the wing lifted far too quickly, causing Jerome to have to break it firmly. This demanded a very fast and accurate response on Jerome's part and could be more difficult to handle by less experienced pilots. Anticipate the behaviour of your wing and adapt your reactions to the situation. Ground handling sessions require an adequate wind speed, which can sometimes develop into stronger conditions. For your safety, therefore, you should know how to effectively collapse your glider. The method you'll have learned at your flying school consists of breaking the wing until it falls behind you. As you can see, this method has its limits, as in strong wind it becomes very strenuous. In addition, the still partially inflated wing drops back through the power zone. At this moment you risk being forcibly dragged backwards by the wing. This is not a particularly comfortable situation in which to find yourself. If you need to collapse the wing in strong wind, turn to face the canopy. It's more easily achieved in this position and avoids you being dragged off. When you decide to collapse it, go with the wing by running towards it. This helps to reduce the power in the wing by depressurizing it. Running forwards is easier. Still facing the wing, you can also collapse it by using the rear risers. Don't hesitate in strong winds, use the rear risers. This is the safest and most effective method. In this way you completely break the profile of the wing. It loses all its energy without pulling you backwards. In every case, use the brakes or the rear risers and go with the wing. You can also move off centre yourself once the canopy is on the ground to prevent it from being able to reinflate. Here's another method. Be careful as it's fairly technical and best suited to pilots of a certain level of skill. It demands precision and must be affected smoothly. This technique consists of collapsing one side of the wing, then stalling the other. With his back to the wing, Russell takes the front risers in one hand and the rear risers in the other. He begins by causing the right side to collapse by firmly pulling on the front risers. When the wing is collapsed, he stalls the other side by pulling on the back risers, preventing any rotation from the open side. The wing finds itself almost instantly deflated and depressurized. It drops gently to the ground. This exercise consists of advancing up an incline while maintaining the glider in the air. It's carried out in light wind and on a gently inclined slope. Watch David as he reclimbs the hill. Two obvious phases are apparent. When the wing is flying or rising, David walks towards it. 
When the wing descends, David stops before it touches the ground and speeds it up by lifting the front risers as during an inflation. The wing rises, he advances. The wing drops again, he stops to give it more speed, and so on. The exercise demands a good regulation of energy input to the wing and a certain amount of anticipation. The wing climbs, you can advance. By moving towards it, you depressurize it, as well as nullifying the effect of the wind. The wing will therefore lose its speed before dropping back. Make sure that you advance gently towards the wing. If not, you risk depressurizing it too quickly, leading to its deflation and the end of its flight. As the wing descends again, stop before it touches the ground and give it some speed using the front risers. Here, watch how Jerome controls each side of the wing independently. He reinflates in turn the right side, then the left, and moves himself to maintain a certain loading on the wing. The wing rises again to its zenith, thus preventing the pilot from advancing further. Use the rear risers to break it and cause it to fall once again. Moving from the front risers to the back quickly and without hesitation is a good exercise in skill and dexterity. To remain in control of the wing, you should also move yourself laterally. This will counter localised changes in wind direction. Here, the wing goes to the right. Jerome naturally shifts himself towards the left to maintain a symmetrical tension between the risers. Once the wind has returned to its previous direction, the glider and pilot realign themselves. This exercise helps you to understand how it's possible to control the speed of each side of the wing by well-calculated inputs to the front risers and repositioning of yourself. Familiarity with these sensations is indispensable in achieving good elevation of the wing during a reverse launch inflation. Here's an exercise which consists of standing up and sitting down while keeping the glider above your head. For this you'll need a moderately strong breeze. To begin, try to sit down and stand up again while maintaining the loading on the wing. If you're too quick, you risk depressurizing the wing suddenly, leading to its collapsing. Therefore try to maintain and feel a continuity in the pressure. Your wing has less or more lift depending on its position within the wind window. This exercise aims to help you feel this lift as well as the zone in which it operates. As it rises towards the zenith, the wing attains its flying speed. The lift is created, then increases. Use the brakes to induce a pitching motion of the wing. Start by braking the wing sufficiently to make it swing firmly backwards. Then slacken the brakes. The wing can now fly again. It accelerates and again ascends to the zenith. At this moment you should feel the increase in lift as the wing pulls upwards. Repeat this pitching movement and attempt to produce an increase in lift which will pull you upright. Observe Jerome as he instigates and utilises this pitching movement of the wing to lift himself up. As the wing moves forwards, he begins by braking it fairly firmly. The wing slows down and he keeps braking. As the wing begins to drop more obviously, he gives it back some speed by raising his hands completely. Climbing towards its zenith, the wing accelerates, the lift increases and pulls him into an upright position. In strong or very strong winds, keep your knees bent and put all your weight on the harness. Ground handling can also be a game. Having worked on various exercises, 
and from the moment you start to feel confident, you can enjoy yourself in your surroundings. Play with the ground. The goal here is to move yourself with the wing above your head without taking off. This low wall is perfect for an attempt to move along its edge without falling. A little break sends the wing to the left, he follows it. Now a little break on the other side to come back. See how Jerome displaces himself smoothly while always keeping some pressure on the controls. This exercise is useful when handling pitching movements of the wing. It's important that you avoid taking off and also that the wing doesn't overfly you, while at the same time preventing it from collapsing. Now Jerome reclimbs the slope. The wing is flying and he can move towards it. The wing drops back. Before it touches the ground he gives it some speed using the front risers. Jerome is now going to use the pulling force of the wing to get back onto the wall. This takes perseverance. Even very experienced pilots don't find this easy. With a bit of practice, changing your position on the ground with your wing over your head will soon become more instinctive. The aim of this exercise is to develop your awareness. It consists of maintaining the wing between the ground and its zenith. Be aware in this case that, as the controls are not held, this is not a ground handling technique to be used when taking off. Take the brake lines in one hand and the front risers in the other. You're going to control the glider by a pendular motion from right to left. By taking the front risers to the right and the brakes to the left, you accelerate the left side of the wing while braking the right. Conversely, by putting the front risers towards the left, the right side of the glider will be accelerated. You will also have to control the speed of the wing to maintain its position. You can accelerate the wing by pulling the front risers upwards or break it by pulling on the brake lines. This is a very useful exercise as it requires delicate control to keep the wing flying. Observe how Timothy simultaneously controls the speed and dissymmetry of the wing. This exercise involves placing the wing at the left and right sides of the wind window. Even in this unusual configuration, it's possible to achieve a state of equilibrium for your wing. When you have learned to bring the glider into this position and keep it there, you can attempt manoeuvres at the edge of the window, such as the barefoot. This exercise requires moderately strong wind conditions. Use the controls to send the glider to one side. Instead of following the glider so as to keep it above your head, turn towards it and oppose it. You can even move in the opposite direction to accentuate the off-balanced effect. In this situation, only the outside brake is effective. It's with this control that you're going to be able to keep the wing in this position. You'll need to find just the right amount of input. If you apply too little outside brake, the wing will lean and pivot until it collapses, the leading edge on the ground. If you apply too much brake, you will prevent the wing remaining at the edge of the window. On the other hand, this is how you can bring the wing back over your head. By keeping this side braked, the wing will progressively change course until it dives to the other side. 
reorientate yourself and use the brake to control this inclination. If the wing has dropped too far or the wind becomes weak, the use of the brakes alone will not be enough to bring the glider back above you. In the first place, you will need to speed up the wing to keep it flying. In order to achieve this, reload the upper side of the wing by pulling on the front riser as David does here. Then, a little paradoxically, as well as giving the wing more speed, you can brake it at the same time to bring it back over your head. You have just seen how to bring your glider to and handle it at the edge of the wind window. Now we will see how you can manoeuvre yourself by using this technique. This could be useful for example to quickly clear the landing area having touched down. To succeed in this exercise you will need at least a moderate breeze. Moving with the aid of the window's edge consists of bringing the end of the wing to between 50 centimetres and a metre from the ground, then moving yourself while maintaining the wing in this position. Start with your back to the wind, the glider stabilised above you. Next, use the brake to send the wing to one side. You can clearly see that the trailing edge is deformed on one side only. The wing begins to turn. Keep braking while orientating yourself in the same direction. The wing dives. Instead of moving underneath as you would to stabilise it, place your body in opposition to the wing. You can now affect your movement by running. The speed and direction of your run must be adapted to the force of the wind. In light to moderate wind, your wing will need more airspeed and your run must therefore be more sustained. To help the wing gain speed, strengthen your resistance and run at a slight angle into the wind. In a stronger wind, your run can be less forceful and less into the wind. Be careful, well loaded in a strong wind, your glider can rapidly gain speed, dragging you with it. The outside brake the one controlling the higher half of the wing allows you to control this tendency. Don't hesitate to use it to slow the wing down and return it to the required angle. To make a U-turn the principle is simple. In the first instance you're going to bring the glider above you before making it dive to the other side. Use the outside brake the wing slows, then comes back over your head. Here you can clearly see that the outside trailing edge is deformed. Continue to move yourself so as to return beneath the wing. Once the wing is stabilised above you, continue to break the same side so as to make it dive in the opposite direction. Firstly, the wing changes direction. As we have just seen, Orientate yourself in the new direction without recentering yourself under the wing. Secondly, the wing dives. You can maintain control with the exterior brake and begin your run. By using the displacement technique with the wing at the edge of the window, it's possible to reclimb a slope. This method is best adapted to stronger conditions. It's therefore practiced in sustained winds. This can be useful, for example, on a dune, where ascending in sand can soon become exhausting, but also on any hill on which you are practicing your ground handling. If the wind is perfectly aligned onto the slope, it's possible to climb the hill in either direction. The principle is the same as the displacement seen earlier. Begin by sending the wing to one side. It dives. Instead of following it as you would in order to keep it above your head, oppose the wing to make it lean further. 
Now it's necessary to give the wing some speed. Run at a slight angle into the wind while remaining in opposition to the wing, thus pressurising the wing and speeding it up more quickly. Once the wing has attained a certain speed, you can change your direction to ascend the hill, while tilting the wing even further with the inside brake. In reality, it's rare that the wind's direction is at exactly 90 degrees to the slope, or even that the hill is angled in the same direction along its length. You can only reclimb the slope by running in the direction facing more into the wind. In the other direction, your run would have to be far stronger in order to displace yourself in this way. With the wind behind you, you are going to either take off or be able to effect a barefoot. To perform a barefoot, the power of the wing must be significantly greater than during the displacement manoeuvre at the window's edge. The pilot can then slide, towed along by his wing. This requires a strong wind. As we have just seen, the direction with your back into the wind makes a barefoot more easily achievable. You should attempt to impart the maximum energy to your wing. Incline the wing, load it by moving away from it, and run. When you feel sufficient force, you can let yourself be pulled. You can perform a barefoot on different types of terrain, on sand, but also on grass or snow. The jive is a U-turn carried out using high speed combined with a sudden reverse of direction. The controlling input and transfer of weight must be regulated to make the wing pivot through 180 degrees as fast as possible. If the turn is slow or the radius too long, you will detach yourself from the slope and take off. On the other hand, if the turn is sharp and the pilot continues moving while the wing begins to turn, he will ensure a perfect loading on the wing. He is then returned by the pendular effect. Je m'appelle David Dago. Uh, ça fait à peu près 18 ans, un peu plus de 18 ans maintenant que je vole, et je travaille avec Ozone depuis uh, 6 ans. Et mon job consiste en fait en, à concevoir les voiles et puis aussi à les tester. On est en fait on est trois dans ce qu'on appelle le, le design team. Euh, Jérôme Cano euh, et Russell Ogden qui, qui m'aident en fait pour, pour la mise au point des voiles et les tests. Et, euh, et moi donc la troisième personne pour, pour faire la conception et puis aussi ben, pour, pour aider mes deux camarades à, à, à tester les voiles et à les mettre au point. Euh, ben pour moi le gonflage c'est une partie du vol finalement, c'est ce qui nous permet de, ben, de nous mettre en l'air. C'est quelque chose qu'on qu privilégie en fait, au début de l'enseignement et qu'on en fait, on oublie assez rapidement parce que ben, finalement voler c'est ça le plus important. Et c'est finalement assez dommage parce que ben, c'est assez ludique finalement que passer du temps à faire du gonflage et ça permet je, je, à mon avis de, de développer des sensations de, euh, sous la voile. On arrive en fait à à un peu mieux comprendre, un peu mieux déchiffrer ce qu'elle dit et se concentrer à travers les commandes. Donc pour moi, c'est vraiment intéressant quand on a l'occasion de, de passer un peu de temps pour, à jouer avec sa voile au décollage pour, pour être vraiment à l'aise. Ça peut qu'aider en l'air de toute manière. La façon dont la voile va se comporter au sol va être beaucoup, beaucoup plus difficile à gérer qu'en l'air. En l'air, en étant donc sans... Le pilote en fait en pendulaire sous, sous la voile, tout va se, se régler 
de façon automatique, alors qu'au sol, c'est au pilote que de se déplacer au bon endroit pour arriver à garder sa balle au-dessus de la tête. Donc en fait, quelqu'un qui va bien se débrouiller au sol va a priori être beaucoup plus à l'aise en l'air. Il y a aussi effectivement le fait qu'on ne vole pas, donc on a moins de vitesse, les, le, le sensation dans les commandes est, est beaucoup plus flou. Donc c'est effectivement plus difficile d'arriver à trouver ces, ces, ces repères, de savoir jusqu'où on peut aller. Et donc d'avoir arrivé à développer ces, 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 ce feeling au niveau du sol va être ben, fabuleux en fait en l'air après. La première chose à faire, je dirais, c'est euh, donc sans, sans parler de, 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 de gonflage face à la voile et de croiser des croisés, on peut simplement parler de, de, de gestion de la voile, euh, en fait du tangage et du roulis euh, ben, en étant statique, enfin sans vouloir décoller. Où en fait on essaie de. Ben, parce que le vent n'est jamais complètement laminaire, le vent, il y a des variations de, de, de force, donc le vent accélère et diminue, euh, le vent change de direction, et ça veut dire que la voile, si on ne bouge pas, en fait, elle va forcément ben, partir en arrière, en avant, se décaler. Et c'est là où, ben, en fait, très, ben, très facilement, quasiment tous les jours, on peut en fait, essayer de, de rester au sol et contrôler sa voile. Euh, on peut au début se servir de, 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 du visuel pour effectivement contrôler sa voile et puis ensuite on peut ben, regarder le sol et simplement en, en termes de sensation se déplacer pour essayer de rester le plus longtemps possible sans faire tomber la voile. Ce serait un exercice général à, en fait, à adresser à tout le monde. Et ensuite après ça on peut se permettre de commencer on va dire, à, à, à se déplacer, c'est-à-dire ben, effectivement se donner une sorte de parcours, essayer de reculer, avancer, se décaler, monter sur un caillou par exemple. Euh, où ben, en fait, ben, on rajoute on va dire, le, ben, une dimension en plus qui est ben, en plus de gérer ce que fait le vent, il ben, faut en plus gérer ce que nous on fait pour, pour, ben, en fait, pour diriger sa voile et aller où on veut sans la faire tomber. Par vent fort, euh, une des, con, des, des techniques consiste à essayer de, de, de ralentir l'accélération le, le, en tangage de la voile au moment où elle finit. Euh, pour ça, il euh, y a deux choses à faire. La première, c'est descendre son centre de gravité, donc s'accroupir pour essayer de, en fait, de servir des jambes pour faire comme un ressort, pour en fait, euh, essayer au moment où la voile finit de monter, pour essayer de, 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 de réduire la quantité de poids, et donc ce qui, fait, ce qui génère l'accélération de la voile. Et la deuxième chose, c'est aussi aller vers la voile. Donc si on gonfle face à la voile, au moment où la voile monte, en fait, le pilote doit donc, décomprimer le, le ressort et tout doucement avancer pour la voile pour finir, finalement diminuer la, la vitesse de, de montée de la voile. Et ça, ça permet effectivement de, de diminuer par 3 euh, la, la, la vitesse euh, à la fin de la montée, ce qui permet de quasiment euh, on va dire, décoller dans des conditions très fortes sans avoir la voile qui, qui dépasse le pilote. Ben, toutes les méthodes sont bonnes, à partir du moment où elles sont ben, ben, bien euh, euh, contrôlées, masterisées par, par le pilote. Euh, L'avantage du, euh, du croisé, c'est que ben, globalement, une fois que la voile est montée au-dessus de la tête, qu'on a contrôlé, le retournement est spontané et rapide, sans, sans temps mort. Dans, par contre, l'inconvénient, c'est que si la voile retombe, ben, on est obligé de la faire retomber par terre pour la reprendre. Elle est très dure à reprendre, parce que les, les freins en étant tirés vont empêcher la montée de la voile. Alors que donc on est en décroisé, euh, bah, l'avantage c'est qu'effectivement bah, si on fait tomber la voile, on peut effectivement la reprendre, on, il y aura très peu de freins impliqués dans, dans, dans la manip. Euh, par contre l'inconvénient c'est qu'au moment où bah, effectivement, il y a le retournement, ça demande effectivement un contrôle et un changement de main qui demande bah, en fait, pas mal plus de pratique. Et c'est euh, avec bah, le risque si on n'a pas assez pratiqué de effectivement, perdre une commande, donc euh, d'être un peu plus à même à, à faire des bêtises. Euh, vraiment le, le point principal c'est il euh, y, a, y, a y a plein de techniques différentes on va dire il n'y a pas une façon de faire qui est la bonne et à partir du moment où on va dire chacun trouve dans une des techniques dans une des méthodes euh, une façon qui, qui lui convient euh, et ben c'est et qu'il la maîtrise pour moi c'est parfait c'est vraiment ça le, le, la, la, la clé de, du succès de, du vol en sécurité et en confort, c'est vraiment le, la maîtrise de, de quelque chose qui, qui, qui nous convient. My name is Timothy Green and this is my twin brother Anthony Green. We 
basically started in like uh, winter of 2002, 2003, where we bought a parachute off of eBay and flew behind a golf cart and off of small hills until we kind of understood about the concepts of flight. The summer of 2004, we started really progressing in acrobatics and working for the Civ course, driving the boat and teaching basic maneuvers. And this is where we found um, a very excellent site where we actually first started kiting. It was, a, it was an island in the middle of a, a, a lake that had a nice steady wing, wind coming onto the shore and, and uh, it was sandy and, and gravelly and it was perfect for learning how to kite and I mean we became very good at kiting uh, when we were not flying and then when we were flying we were understanding and we put the correlation between the two right then and there. And yeah and we immediately understood why our instructor said that when you're really good at kiting you're a really good pilot because all of the kiting is the exact same as when you're flying and so we could see the direct correlation when somebody was learning there and they were really bad at flying you could see them in the air they were bad at yeah at doing the acro. they would ask uh, our instructor what can I do to become a better pilot and he would say oh get out there and kite like the rest of them Control the wing reacts the same way in the air as it does when you're on the ground because the wing is in the air and so when you're doing uh, an asymmetric deflation or anything in the air, it's kind of dangerous because you can get a cravat and spiral to the ground. But if you do it when you're on the ground already, an asymmetric deflation, there's very little danger that can happen. So you can practice a lot of the SIV or uh, the normal maneuvers on the ground in the safe environment where you can really learn how to control the wing. So like you can be on the sand and just pull a full frontal, like the biggest you've ever seen and nothing's going to happen because you're already on the ground. Yeah, but you still understand what is happening to the glider. And also you can, by ground handling, you learn so much about like the surging of the glider. Like you understand um, when you're taking off, if you don't uh, brake check, the glider will go in front of you and frontal and you understand the dynamics. It's like uh, it's amplified all of the, the motions of the glider when you're on the ground are, are increased. Like the glider is not normally stable when you're standing on the ground, it always wants to go to the side. And when you're ground handling, if you're constantly controlling the glider, keeping it above you, um, it's, you learn so much more for when the glider is stable above you, then you know what hap what like, for instance, you hit some turbulence, your glider surges, you know to brake and to weight shift to correct the, the movement of the glider, and then you you feel so much more since uh, you have a you have a reference. The ground is the reference. So if uh, if you get pulled up, you feel the pulling, and you realize that much pull brought you up one meter. And then uh, by releasing the brakes, you come down. And you have more speed. You realize that you do have more speed, and that you come into motion like this because you have a reference like right right there, and you really understand the the aspects of the glider and the yeah, and a lot of uh, students and new pilots come up to us and ask, so when, how do we know when the wing is going to stall? And like, what point will, will the wing stall and how long do I have to hold the brakes down? And we say, well, don't go and try it way up high in the air because you can have a lot of problems. You yeah. just come on landing or when you're at, on the dune, you can just brake, brake, brake and just uh, half a meter off the ground and keep braking until you feel it stall. And then you know that that's the stall point. Yeah. do almost well you can do every maneuver in the air that you can on on the ground just by you can put your glider up on the edge and uh, apply brake on the high side and it's exactly like a set it's the same uh, same, same body motion. motion it's just staying still instead of rotating around you yeah so I you mean, just have like all of your weight shift on one side and the brake and it's just keeping there and then you let out and it goes too far down and it would be like exiting a set where it just falls into the sand, oh, and if you pull too much, it goes too far up and stalls and spins, so it'd be like a coconut spin.
So for like uh, having the wing pull you up the hill like a sailboat going up, uh, you basically are standing straight below your wing with it kited and stable, and you just uh, break on one side to turn the wing to that side. Instead of following underneath it like you would to keep it stable and above your head, you lean away from it and it comes to the side and then it often can hit the ground and just like stay there and then you can bring it back up and you control it with the, the top brake to bring it up and to bring it down. And then when you want it to start taking you up the hill, you have to lean away from it and then run like in the same direction and normally upwind a little bit because it has to be cross otherwise you have to be going too fast. And you can brake to actually give it more lift and pull you up the hill faster. So at the beginning normally you have to run down the hill a little bit to get some speed in the wing and then as it gets speed and creates more lift then you start running up the hill and you yeah. just control it and keep the wing tip touching the ground or just a half a meter up because if it goes too far up then it stops pulling you up and it kind of takes off. And then for when the wind is perfectly straight up the hill, you can do it in both directions. So to change direction, I find uh, instead of bringing it up uh, quite slowly, because it has quite a lot of speed and you're running, and normally you take off and fly like away from the hill, the best thing is to stay on the ground to go up the hill as fast as you can. So you bring it up and then you kind of spin the wing like 180 degrees, and you turn your body at the same time. And then when the wing is on the other side, then you just control it and make sure that the wing is installed or something. And then you continue going up the other direction. Yeah, and as far as barefooting, it's the same thing. It's just instead of running, you're sliding your feet like away from the, the sand and away from your wing. And the wing is basically like controlled, dragging you up the hill. And then for the same, the same way, you kind of slide up the hill and you twist the wing and, uh, and you change direction, just dragging your feet the whole time. And then as far as jumping with the, the wing on the dune, I usually take a, like a half twist, you know, so I'm facing my wing and you can see what is happening. And take the Ds, like I just clip the brakes on and take the Ds. And so I brake it and often with the Ds it doesn't stall as easily. So you can add more brake without it like going back on the dune. And then when you want to make your jump, it has to be quite windy. You just let the D up and give it a surge and jump back and then break and it brings you up and then it's just like controlled surges. Yeah. Basically like dolphin going up and down like this but just uh, on the dune. Yeah, well my objective is basically to just continue flying and have as much fun as I can. And my goal is obviously to have as much fun where like if I was to go into teaching or doing something, I think I would lose a lot of the, the fun aspect of the sport. So I think we will continue flying as much as we can and yeah. traveling as much as we can. And festivals are our favorite to travel at because there's no stress and we just make a nice show and it's, it's free flight. It's the most unrestricted um, event that we can do. It's so. I think right now we'll try to finish our studies as, much, as fast as we can and then what we've learned throughout our life is we can't really plan anything because it's always going to change so there's really no yeah. point in planning it. But so, paragliding will definitely be a part of our life. Yeah, for a long time. Yeah. Here's a way to turn your wing over when the leading edge is against the ground. The situation often occurs when you collapse the wing. On the beach, you can also use this technique to empty the wing of any sand collected inside it, the weight of which could prevent it from flying.
Therefore, the objective is to turn the wing on its yaw axis. How's it done? From a central position, with yourself and the wing in line with the wind's direction, as when taking off, use a single brake to induce the rotation. The trick consists of shifting yourself slightly in the opposite direction, which will break the wing's alignment with the wind. This has the effect of accentuating the asymmetrical climb of the wing, greatly speeding up the side you're trying to bring back. Once this half of the wing has returned to the correct side, you can follow your wing and pre-inflate it in the normal way to finally reposition it. Strong conditions are the cause of a lot of accidents at takeoff. Inflation in stronger winds is possible, but demands a good mastery of the technique. Here's a tip for reducing the power of the wing during inflation. On a glider equipped with four front risers, use only the central ones to affect the inflation. Only the middle of the wing will be under tension during the inflation and thus the pressure is greatly reduced. Here's a technique for practicing inflation at the edge of the wind window requiring two people. As we have seen at the edge of the window, the power of the wing is reduced. This technique can therefore be useful in strong wind, but demands an excellent technical level of skill. It will help you carry out your training in safety. Always practice in a moderate breeze. Alter the alignment of wind pilot wing so as to position the wing at the edge of the wind window. Your assistant will then control the wing's climb from becoming too fast. By changing your position, you can control the loading on the wing. Thanks to the outside brake, you ensure the axis of the climb. It only remains to recenter yourself beneath the wing. I often try to reach the stars I never caught a single one I hope you'll be my guide That you'll be the one The one that will set me free
to get away We never touched the ground again